Uh, this book is not just an attempt to uh, follow Imran's journey. It is also an attempt to explain the, the carnival of mess, of mayhem, of suffering, of crisis that the country has been over the last very many years, thanks to repellent military dictatorships and completely inept and irresponsible democratic regimes that have never delivered. So it, not, it's not when you read this book, it's not only Imran's political life, it's not only a political biography, it would be an, a good introduction to the kind of Pakistan we've had over the last three decades. So um, I think this would appeal to students, to political scientists, and anyone who's interested in Pakistan's politics and Imran Khan. Uh, the rise of Imran, uh, basically you know, to understand the rise of Imran, um, we briefly need to run through the period between the late 1980s and the late 1990s. And this period is also characterized by colossal levels of corruption committed by two leading political mafias, I would call them, uh, Pakistan Muslim League and the Pakistan People's Party. And the, the, I use the word mafia because there was a, there is a left wing intellectual from Oxford, a, a, a renowned author, Tariq Ali, who was, a, who was an acquaintance. And he, he once, he was also a classmate of Benazir, and he once said to Benazir that, look, your, why don't you do something about your husband? Everyone's talking about your husband being so corrupt. And she said, why are you being so prudish, Tariq? They're all doing it. So that was the attitude of your, you know, of, the, the, of your democrat democratically elected leaders. Uh, throughout the 90s, we saw massive corruption, huge macroeconomic instability, hyperinflation, foreign reserves depleting, ethnic violence, and that basically laid the foundation of uh, for Imran, you know, because his manifesto appealed to a completely different class, the youth, which was rapidly emerging, who had grown disillusioned by the kind of Pakistan they had seen. So his, his appeals struck a chord. Uh, and, and, and then he established his political party, his, his manifesto was, was strewn with pretty ideas. No other political party had so vociferously campaigned against cor corruption as Imran. You know, whether he has become, whether he will be able to deliver or not, that's a completely different, I mean, I'll have to open a completely different can of worms. Uh, going to finish now. Uh, as a Grant Lincoln once stated, nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. So Imran's real test begins now. Thank you very much, students, for having me here. Thank you, Vito. We've got uh, probably maybe 10 minutes left. Um, we welcome all opinions at HSC College, and part of being uh, in an intellectual environment is to, to listen to questions. And are there any questions or comments you'd like to? Direct towards our speaker today. Yes, please. Could you stand up when you ask the question? So basically, uh, when did you decide that you had to write about the bar? What fascinated you? Well, uh, that's a very difficult question. Um, he, uh, as I said, I mean, he's always been a hot property, in not only in Pakistan but globally. And uh, it would be wrong to say that you know I decided to write about Imran because of the commercial prospects of the book. But I thought that the book, the kind of star appeal the man has, or the, the, the kind of controversy he is able to generate each time he says something or you know, dispatches a tweet. I thought, if I, if, if, and then there was no no book that you know summed up his political career. So, uh, and I was always interested, I, you know, Tariq Ali was my intellectual role model, I was always interested in reading about, in reading about not, not just Pakistan's politics, but also you know, the entire South Asia and, 
um, following the US, you know, Chomsky is another role model. So I thought that my first book should be on politics, it should be about Pakistan. And, and you know, for the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, Imran has been the main state. That's, I think, the biggest reason. Yes. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. Army, the, the, the military establishment has been the most uh, organized and the most powerful institution in the country. Uh, but we are seeing, you know, we are, we've seen a slight drift from that position. Uh, when Zulfikar Ali, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto is a classic example of that. In 1958, when Ayub Khan came into power, his, his, his youngest minister, uh, Minister of Commerce was Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. So before coming into politics, Bhutto was a, a non-commodity. He was not known. It was the it was you know the military that man threw him into the deep end of politics, manufactured him, honed him, and then later on, after Bhutto, Nawaz Sharif came from a moneyed industrialist family. He was a, a not a known commodity uh, in, in, in Pakistan. It was General Ziaul Haq who nurtured him, manufactured him, prepared him for politics, prepared him for corruption. And then later on in the 90s, uh, after 90s, in the early 2000s, uh, the Chaudhrys of Gujarat, they were manufactured you know, under, under, under General Musharraf. So it's the army that they basically caused the shot. Now we know that, you know, despite knowing that the army is such an indispensable part of the country's uh, governance structure. I don't think that Imran's rise to power is entirely you know, backed by the army. That's because in 1995, he, Imran is one character, uh, he's, you know, he has a temperament of his own, he's blunt, he's brusque at times. I don't think he's the kind of temperament he has had. I don't think he, he's ever able to work with generals before. You know, in 1995, General Hamid Gul, who was an ISI frontman, he approached Imran, he wanted to create a pressure group to keep a check on these two leading political parties of the country, but Imran denied the temptation. He worked with the pressure, he stayed, uh, he, he became part of the pressure group for around six months, but then he later had a bitter fallout with the general. He had a fallout with General Zayam Haq. So, I mean, we must, all this talk that I, we hear that he is entirely backed by the military's is basically undermining the man's struggle. The problem is, will he be able to work with the generals? That's completely, that's a completely different matter. Anything else? I think the headmistress has a question. I just want to thank you so much. Well, I, I think you have. Uh, I come from a, a country with no land borders, it's just surrounded by the sea. We can't run ourselves. Uh, and you're a country surrounded by land and politics and history. Um, I, I remember studying a, a little bit. This, uh, I sometimes think the creation of East and West Pakistan was a bit like a Versailles Treaty. Was it ever meant to succeed? I don't know. Could it have succeeded? I, I wish I hadn't missed the first part of this because um, it's an extraordinary history and I'm, I'm very pleased that someone's come here and if you like, uh, unloaded their views on things. You should as a historian. How many are doing history? A few. Well, you should know that history is a debate, and until you can have that debate in, in calm and logic, uh, and sometimes you listen to things you don't believe in, but the sign of being intellectual is you can accept that, process it, ask questions, debate, disagree, etc. So I think today's been a wonderful exercise in that. Thank you, BJ, for coming. And we're going to honour you, I think, with a, a tie from one of our previous speakers.